So we're from the region, Regional and Strategic Leadership Committee. Yes, we are running a hybrid meeting due to COVID-19 alert level restrictions. This means there is no public gallery at this meeting. Therefore, for those members who are joining us online, please use the chat function to speak or question. Silence will be taken as agreement. I've been informed by Christina that we have a quorum and I'm pleased to declare this meeting um, this meeting open. Um, and I will open the meeting with a mihi and then uh, Councillor Farm will follow with a karakia. So, no mai hari mai kiti riri na mihi kia koutu ki tini hui te komiti kia koutu na me tau ki waitaha ki na kai mahi tena koutu ki koni matu ki te whakarongo ki te korero ki te whānanga no reira kia ka kia a gatu. Kia ora, Chair, Kia ora, Poto. Ko Fakataka te hau te karakia. Fakataka te hau ki te tonga, ki te uru, sorry. Fakataka te hau ki te tonga. Kia mā kina kina ki uta, kia mā taratara ki tai. E he ake ana, te atakura, he tio, he huka, he hauhu, te hei mauri ora. Mauri ora. Uh, kia ora, um, and can I welcome those people online? Um, uh, Arupu uh, Chairs, uh, Colter Carson, and I think uh, Alice Stocking are online. And we also have online uh, Pumataya Cramwell. We have apologies from uh, Councillor Pauling, who is a leave of absence from Council at this stage, uh, from Tumutaya Yvette Councillor Lewis. And we have apologies, I think, Nicole, from from Tane, Megan, Councillor Apanui, Councillor Hands, and Councillor Ian McKenzie. Did you that? Yeah, and if, okay. yes, I did. So, so those are the apologies. Uh, thank you. Uh, conflicts of interest, are there any? I believe there are no public forums, deputations, or petitions. Uh, item five, extraordinary urgent business. I don't think there is any or there isn't any being brought to my attention and there are no notices of motion. So if we could move to point 7.1, unconfirmed minutes, and we're looking um, if there's any um, matters of accuracy in these minutes for the meeting date. No hands up. Uh, so we'll move to the recommendation on 7.1, which is on screen that the Regional and Strategic Leadership Committee confirms the minutes from the Regional and Strategic Leadership Committee meeting held 22nd of June 2022. Moved by um, Councillor Mackay, seconded by Councillor Sunk. All those in favour, please say aye. All those against, carry. Thank you. Uh, moving to 8.1, Regional and Strategic Leadership Committee resolution status report. Um, which is on page 15 of your agenda. I just like to note there are two things uh, that we we wanted to talk about, um, which were unresolved matters within the resolutions, and the first of them is on. Can I get to it? Uh, which is on page 17, and it's the last resolution on the paper um, regarding uh, the waste management committee. Um, and I've just been informed there is a there's a meeting of the committee on the 4th of September. We won't have a rep at that meeting because the paper isn't done yet for us uh, in terms of getting us there. Uh, uh, the letter from uh, Chair Huey accepting the invitation to join the committee has been sent to the Chair, Councillor Chen uh, from Christchurch City. Um, and we haven't had the arrangement docked back yet, although hence our rep uh, we don't know who our rep is, and we'll be brought back to the new council in the new triennium. So that's just an update on where that's at. And then the other bit is uh, the MOU with Canterbury University, and I think that's due to be signed soon. It's not signed, so that 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 also will carry over uh, into the next session. Councillor Bearwood. So um, I, I'm presuming that before October would mean. Um, as part of this training, surely, or is it not going to be? That's point advice on that. Anyone give me advice on that? You're probably right. 
Um, yet the last I'd heard from Tim Davy was that it, they're trying to get it done as quickly as possible so that it is part of this council signing that. Yep. So we can keep council posted. If we Thank you. So we'll, it won't come back to this committee, but it'll come back to council. OK. It's, it's been approved in content already. Yes, it's, it just needs the official signing. Yep. And so the last one um, on page 19, I presume that's a yes. The tick box. Isn't it? It's on page 18. It's the yes, but you're right. The table has split. So yep. it's on eight. Yeah, it's on 18 and 19, so that's um, that's a yes. So thank you for that. Um, any anything else regarding that? Uh, eight point one. Uh, so the resolution is on screen for eight point one that the regional and strategic leader committee leadership committee notes the status of previous resolutions providing the status regional and strategic leadership committee resolutions report was twenty twenty two and also notes those um, updates. i am moving for that. Thanks, uh, Councillor um, Edge, and seconded by Councillor Sunkel. All those. Have Favor, please say aye. All those against uh, carried. So uh, that moves us to 8.2, um, which is the um, I hope I got that right, a representation. And this um, paper has been um, prepared by Coulter, uh, Carson, Alice Docking, and Kimberly Forbes. So I'm not too sure which one of you want to lead off on this. Do you want to lead off on this, Coulter? Uh, kia ora. Uh, yeah, yeah, happy to do that, Peter. Thank you very much. Uh, kia ora koutou, ko, koutou, aho. Um, I've introduced, introduced myself a few times around here, but um, yeah, once again, thank you to Regional Strategic Leadership for having us. Um, quite keen to see this relationship um, continue. Apologies as well. Um, I'm a bit crook today, so um, apologize for any sniffing, um, but it is really important. I feel like what we've got to say today, so I wanted to make sure to be a, uh, on here today. Um, yeah, cool. So we're just going to we're going to get a bit of a, a quick rundown um, of our paper, just sort of reiterating some stuff and then we'll have some time in the end for questions. Um, yeah, unfortunately, Alice and I both do need to shoot off after we, we speak today, um, but that, as you'll see, is related to what we're speaking about as well um, in a bit of a meta way. Uh, cool. But yeah, Alice and I are here today. Oh, sorry. First of all, can everybody hear me? OK. Yeah, we can hear you. Yep. Oh, great. OK. Yep. Alice and I are here to speak uh, about our most re recent mahi in the um, governance hoi, which is a working group we've set up within the youth ropu. Uh, Alice and I both share an interest in, um, yeah, sort of the, the larger scale, kind of larger time scale um, workings and projects within the ropu. So uh, her and I are both working on this. A um, bit of a background about what we're talking about today. Um, in a broad context, youth engagement on environmental and governance decision making is crucial. You all know this, but you know the decisions that shape the future of youth, the decisions that you make um, sort of affect our future to a greater extent than some other demographics. Um, this is especially uh, important for long term, large scale matters such as resource management, urban planning um, and climate change. Uh, kia ora koutou, um, I'm Alice. So we we're feeling that like youth um, can deliver on levels of service in ways that other groups uh, might not be able to, such as like uh, involvement, with public transport, and civics engagement. And most recently, we, the Ropu demonstrated this with our annual plan engagement campaign, which saw a significant boost in youth response. So basically, uh, the issues that we're looking at. Um, affect all uh, youth engagement in um, wherever it happens um, and the things that we all need to be aware of. So this is your classic tokenism, lack of support, um, inequity. Basically, uh, youth need support to build capacity for engagement. Um, and yeah, we as as the youth ropu, uh, we represent young people in a time scarce stage of life where activities such as engagement with politics and advocacy are often pushed to the side um, by day to day life. Uh, and essentially what we're saying today is uh, 
uh, if we want to, if regional strategic leadership um, is interested in to continue uh, working with the Uthropu, um, we wish to sit at the table, uh, not necessarily in the public seating area where we have done in the past. We feel like the voluntary aspect of the Uthropu limits the potential of um, our members and we'd like to see the introduction of new support mechanisms with associated deliverables that could help build capacity and reduce the biases and inequities between um, between the two groups. Yeah, well, yeah, adding on that, my since my experience with Oropu since about November uh, of last year, um, I've come to, yeah, I've been dealing with the same issue um, within the Oropu, and I've sort of recognized now that the Oropu itself is a bit of a training ground, um, and I think it's quite valuable for that, where youth who want to sort of dabble in the decision making and environmental space can have a go and get and like be in a room with with like minded people and have support from ECAN staff, which is awesome. However, there is a lack of pathways for progression, which has created a bit of a glass ceiling for members who want to go further. So we'd like to see. Um the formalisation of youth committee positions, um, potentially two seats with uh, compensation and deliverables, so quite similar to the um, intergenerational member of the Climate Change Committee uh, with Irana. So this is something that we've been working on for a while, um, and there are a couple of things that will be really key to the success of, of the solution that we're proposing. Um, mainly that being that the parameters of the roles that we're developing will be made in collaboration with Regional Strategic Leadership Committee, um, to Matayo, key ECAN staff, um, to just ensure the highest level of benefit and to basically make sure that what we establish is watertight and will work best for everyone. And we're totally aware that, um, you know, we don't hold all the answers and we, yeah, want to draw on the expertise in the in the council chambers right now. Yeah, and we want to make sure that we have fair deliverables and like clear measures of success to make sh to clarify how like what a good uh, youth committee member uh, looks like. We also want to make sure that we've got a defined system so that um, youth members uh, in in this council here have a good means of feeding back and linking with the youth ropu. This is a lesson that we've learned from. Um, our establishment of positions on water zone committees and the, the climate change committee with Edna as well is that there's a bit of a lack, um, a disconnect between the Ropu and those like Ropu alumni um, who have really valuable skills and that insight into those other groups. So we want to make sure that there's a really yeah, good system to link back to the Ropu as well. And with that, we want to make sure that we've got like a formalized mechanism for ongoing youth representation within the committee. So um, and to work with the three year term. So with um, if any young person like can't commit to the full three years, we want to make sure that we've got a crossover period where we can guarantee that there will still be that youth input and the same feedback um, happening to the DOFU. Yeah. Cool. Thank you very much for, for listening. And um, yeah, we're at the stage now where we can take some questions. That's pretty much all we wanted to say. Just to reiterate again, um, what we were hoping to do today is just to kind of lay out our concerns and um, where how we're feeling essentially about the, the ROPU and regional strategic leadership. Um, and just to let you know that we are working on uh, developing a means to improve this this relationship um, and that should be ready. Uh, we'll have that formalized proposal um, in about five weeks time at the next meeting in, in September. But yeah, any questions? Uh, thank you for that, uh, Colton. Thank you for picking up the challenge, I think, that Jenny and I put to you about how we can challenge each other in the space we are, because we do not, as you say, do not want to make it at a face value judgment. So what we will do now is we'll take questions, and then, um, then what um, I'll do is I'll put the recommendations, and then Council can have a, a general discussion about, about this that you can sit back and listen to, and then we'll see where we get to from there. So uh, Chair Huey has got a question. Um, no, I just want to make a statement to follow up to say thank you very much for bringing this to the committee. And Peter and I met with you, as Peter's indicated, and I just want to assure you that um, there are staff available to assist with developing this. So I think it's um, not doesn't need to be as a big, long and strung out process. We can get it to the council for next term. So it's really good that you came back and talking more straightforward to us like this. 
And I personally support exactly what you just described. Um, so I think it's congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I'll just ask councillors just to announce themselves, I guess, but the next one's Phil. Councillor Phil Clearwater, Kira Coulter and, and Alice. Um, th up, thank you for this heads up. It's, it's a helpful for, for us to help look at how we can um, support support your group. Really, I just um, one thing I just I presume did happen, and that was I understand that um, the youth ROPU were invited as part of the strategic public transport strategic stakeholders group. Just hoping you're able to get to that uh, initial meeting, and does that is that perhaps a, an example of where you know the youth ROPU can can be involved. I think that's actually very interesting you mentioned that. Um, I I won't go on for too long about this. I absolutely could. Um, I We were involved with that. We were invited to that. Um, essentially, we were in a room um, with about 20 other stakeholders. Uh, it was Amanda and myself. Amanda is uh, in high school and like kind of struggled to get out of school to be there at the meeting from, from 12 till midday. Uh, sorry, from 12 till 2 p.m. Um, it was just another example of how in my opinion, the youth engagement aspect uh, wasn't superbly dealt with and that we were in a room and we were one of the few groups that was not compensated for their time. For instance, there were some industry stakeholders, there were um, you know, people representing businesses that were on a payroll essentially, and then there were Amanda and myself who were there um, voluntarily uh, sort of taking time away from uni and and in the case of Amanda she like had to jump through some hoops to get out of school um, and there just there wasn't really space for us to engage properly on that so yeah I, I've so I followed that up with Roz and um, yeah I think that's a very poignant example and and does have a lot of connection um, but yeah I would like to see a similar kind of thing happen uh, you know that that what we're proposing with this group um, to some of those other uh, potential avenues as well, like Greater Christchurch, for instance. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Th thank you, Colter, for that feedback, and I'm glad you followed up with Roz, and we'll certainly look at how, how we can um, support improvements here. Alice, did you have something to say there, or are you happy? Uh, no, no, I'm happy with what Colter's just said. Yeah. Thank right. You. right. Right. Hi, Colter and Alice, uh, Councillor Reach speaking. Um, I'm just uh, interested in um, your relationships and alignment with other youth councils across Canterbury, and how do you communicate with them? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I can speak to that, Colton. Uh, so across Canterbury, we're a part of the Youth Voices Canterbury Network, and Colter has attended a few meetings for that one. But also we've got hui, we've had a hui earlier in the year with um, youth councils in across Otata, um across Aotearoa with the youth councils in Bay of Plenty and Waikato, which is where we like developed our ideas on how our youth ropu structure can work, and that's where the development of our hui um, came about. But um, in terms of across like Canterbury, I think we're connecting more with like groups such as School Strike for Climate, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, maybe Colter, you can. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, you pretty much covered all the bases there, but yeah, I think the main one is Youth Voices Canterbury. That's kind of that. My understanding is that organisation, their function is to, yeah, sort of act as a act as a linking organization for for the various uh, youth ropu and youth councils um, so that's something that we are quite keen to continue with um, like for instance uh, they are doing some really cool work um, that's you know sort of based on feedback from from myself and from some other ropu members about developing a um, a code of youth engagement for for businesses and for organizations um, around Waitaha to sort of pick up to have as like a bit of a reference for like and this is so basically, yeah, just like a, a one pager that would say if you want to engage with with youth groups or youth in general, here's how you do it. Um, but yeah, that kind of thing. Um, also, yeah, on Monday, there's a uh, youth uh, high school like environmental group who we that um, some of our some of our members are, are organizing. Um, and that sort of illustrates how we're working these days in, in the in the working groups. 
yeah cool sorry but yeah we we are kind of connecting with other groups for sure so thanks for that all right thank you just just a follow-up question then um in terms of just say picking on one one of those other youth groups how do how are they participating for example say Waimakariri how do they participate with the Waimakariri District Council and what, what's what's their involvement there if you could that's a that's a great question and um, my understanding at the moment based on my conversations with with ECAN staff is that what we're proposing essentially like what we we're talking about today is pretty groundbreaking in terms of in terms of youth engagement in in New Zealand um, yeah my my understanding is that this is not something that other other youth groups around the country are doing um, and I but I don't have a super clear understanding of of um, how how the like YMAC is um, is working on that specifically um, as I said uh, our main connection with them is at those um, we don't have a very close direct connection with them. It would be more through Youth Voice Canterbury. Um, so we don't really delve into those inner workings, but those are conversations I'd love to have. Great. Just just final final question. It, it would be useful in your feedback for the September meeting if you could probably communicate with them and, and uh, give some sort of feedback on what they and maybe one other um group are doing and the, the concerns expressed for those i think that would be great thank you awesome cheers i think sorry colter maybe i'll just speak to that a little bit is i attended a master's seminar on youth in, like um engagement and his findings were very much that i think it was around um he did it in blenheim but and i don't know the specifics but he was finding that a lot of youth were very frustrated with their um, the like level of engagement and then the like the taken seriously aspect of it I think so yeah I think definitely um a first maybe what we're proposing Thank you. Kia ora, Vicky South, Hapla, Vicky Southworth. Um, just interested in, um, well, firstly, I think what you're proposing is great because there is a issue around diversity and there's actually a real struggle to get people to even stand this time around for local government. So great that you're, I, you know, I hadn't thought about the concept of being like a, a sort of breeding grounds, probably the wrong word, but, you know, like a place where there's helping people to see what local government does and helping you to find a way to give your voice at the early stages to sort of get a most inspire others and also to get your own drive to bring foot ahead um i'm just wondering in terms of the um the financial compensation side of things for your time and that you know if you stated it really well why that's important i'm just wondering whether another issue around local government is, is diversity of voices not just in terms of youth but in terms of demographic and i have been, you know our table is for the most part very educated and, and i think you know middle class for want of a better word um and i want and i sort of get a sense of the similarity of the youth role crew as well now do you think that the proposal to have the time compensated would help to encourage a wider diversity of applicants to the youth raw crew, which is a discussion we have around council compens councillor compensation as well. I'm so glad you asked Vicky this has been like kind of my just my vendetta lately and one of my one of the things that I recognize is one of the biggest short shortcomings of the ROPU is that what I'm constantly told, and and Oscar, uh, who was who was chairperson before me, something that he was particularly interested in was pursuing some kind of compensation as well, um, is that it's just not possible to do good youth engagement with um, with compensation. The ROPU, what I'm told by Ikan Seth, is that the ROPU needs to be um, self-directed, um, and adding compensation adds deliverables, and it just doesn't work. So. Yeah, what I've recognized is that because the ROPU, the incentive to join the ROPU, once you join, you can put it on your CV. Once you put it on your CV, you have all the incentives of joining and there's nothing beyond that. And what has, I mean, effectively nothing beyond that. Um, and what that's resulted in is a pretty poor representation of youth across demographics. Um, uh, yeah, across across Canterbury. Um, 
and I think that this is a real opportunity to to change that um, because it, this is not part of the ROPU specifically. It's a different role, something that I'm quite keen and that there's a bit of disagreement um, so far uh, is to these roles potentially recruit wider than the ROPU because of exactly what I said. I don't want to carry the biases of the ROPU into these roles necessarily. So if there's any way to combat that inequity that we've seen in the ROPU, I'm really keen to try and make that happen. Um, but yeah, I guess it's just I, I have a strong feeling that there's some people, there's someone who would be super good for the role who isn't necessarily in the ROPU that may not have heard about the ROPU or may not have heard about this role because they're not because of the school that they're at or the the lack of shoulder tapping that kind of thing so yeah super keen to pursue that and try and fight that inequity thing okay we've got a few more questions and we'll wrap this up but that point that you made council southworth is part of the consideration that we'd spoken to colgra and alice about that if we expect um there to participate and to you know to to really participate then we need to probably job size that somehow and and talk to them about that but that is a conversation that's probably going to be more on your side of the you know what is appropriate and those sorts of things so we've got councillor Mackay and then councillor uh elizabeth mckenzie and then we'll put the motion thank you colter and alice it's quite an interesting um perspective that you're bringing to the table and and, and idea for us to consider and I guess, Colty, you've just segued a little bit into where I'm coming from as I've sat here and listening is around the diversity and, and interests being represented, for example, at, at this regional leadership, um, the strategic leadership committee level is if it's not coming through one of our committees, um, where where would the boundary be, for example, of other sectors or communities out of um, you know people people out of communities within the wider Canterbury region? Um, stop and start. I, it's just a challenge, I guess. I'm really putting. You might not be able to answer it yet. You've sort of alluded to some tensions, obviously, within the Euro, youth youth around this early discussion, and I guess that's all I'm probably flagging because. You know, there has to be some sort of boundaries um, here. I think um, when we have spoken to this, we've said that we'd have to set some parameters and some like requirements for feedback into the ROPU. So if they're not necessarily a member of the ROPU, they would still have to um, have a level of engagement with us to make sure that we don't lose the connection between um, the ROPU and the committee. Um, yeah. Additionally, um, something perhaps that we didn't mention in what we were describing earlier is that we're super keen to develop a very like defined framework um, for for measuring the success. Or I think Alice, Alice might have mentioned that um, so that when we get someone in there, first, our recruitment pros process is very stringent and whatever it is, however we decide of who this person is, we that they're the right person or they're the best person. And then once they're there, depending on we need to we need to just have some kind of system there so that we can quantify like if they're doing a good job. Um, and so those things are, are super important to me because it just needs to be we need to remove all subjectivity from that that we can. Um, but yeah, in terms of in terms of which demographics need to be included, I think it's it's a pretty tough one. Um, I guess youth is is quite broad because it's it's a it's a pretty classically underrepresented um, demographic that is is also very broad. But yeah, it's a yeah it's a maybe a question that's a bit broader than I can answer right now. I just want to say I really support the ideas and the initiative that you've. Put, it, put together. Um, I think this is kind of a unique time. Um, I mean, I don't, I'm not sure that there would be any other time where a, a youth having a youth member on committees or subcommittees would be something that councils would do. But because of climate change, we absolutely have to have this intergenerational um, representation, this ability to look forward into the future. Um, and so, you know, I sort of see, you know, I see that we would need youth representation on nearly every um, committee or subcommittee 
um, that we have on council. So I'm very supportive of, of this way of thinking. And I've seen, you know, overseas, like in Wales, for example, that they're doing this kind of thing. So, yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, guys. I'm uh, aware that Kimberly is there. Kimberly, have you got anything to add? Kia No, nothing at all. They've said it beautifully as always. Just here to support. <laughs> They play a pretty important part here, and I'm I'm sure with uh, yourself and Coulter and Ellis, you'll bring this forward. And I note I note in the next steps that there is a communication back to the chair and myself to forward this for the September meeting. So I'm looking forward to that. So what we'll do now is we'll put the motions, and we'll wait for Christina to put them up on the on the board, uh, and we'll put the motions there that are in front of you that the regional and strategic. Leadership Committee notes the Yuparopu intention to develop a proposed mechanism to enhance youth representation on regional and strategic leadership matters. And two, notes that Youth Ropu will present a proposal to the September 2022 meeting of the Regional and Strategic Leadership Committee for approval to be passed to the new council for consideration. Do I have a mover for that? Thanks, Phil. And seconded by moved by Councillor Clearwater and seconded by Councillor Farm. So thank you for that. Um, can, can, do we need to go around the table? I think there's, there's pretty good approval rating here for this to go ahead. Is, do we need some discussion or does anybody, any councillor want to say anything? Okay, so the motions are in front of put by Councillor Clearwater and Councillor Farm. All those in favour, please say aye. All those against? Carried. So thank you, Colga, uh, Ellis, and Kimberly for your participation. We look forward to seeing you in September. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Katite. Cecilia, um, 8.3 Future for Local Government Review. Uh, this paper's been prepared by Cecilia. So, Cecilia, Cecilia, if you want to speak to that. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I'll just um, briefly cover the key points of um, the paper today. Um, so the purpose of the paper is to provide um, an update of the, to the committee on, on the future for local government review and um, the next steps there. Um, so the review was initiated back in April 2021 um, by the Minister of Local Government. Um, and since then, the independent panel that was appointed um, has un undertaken an initial scoping phase which resulted in an interim report um, published last September. And then they've undertaken a broader engagement phase, which included visiting all councils. Um, and they came to council at the end of March of this um, year um, to meet with council and discuss um, sort of keys of the themes of the future for local government. Um, a summary of some of those topics um, that we covered in that um, council discussion um, has been provided in, in the paper um, with themes such as um, council strength and ability um, to partner with others, particularly um, Papatupu Runanga, um, but also um, territorial authorities and community groups in the regional sector. Um, there was a discussion around the sort of central and local government um, relationship and the need to create a general partnership um, there for the future of local government and also the discussion around the need for um, better funding arrangements, um, the burden of long-term planning and um, the need for improved um, capability and capacity across all um, levels of government um, to be able to deliver what's required. So in terms of the next steps, the um, panel are now um, focusing on drafting the um, draft report and recommendations, which is expected to be released in the middle of October. Um, the panel gave a speech at the recent LGNZ conference at the end of July um, and gave some sort of early indications of um, what the draft report might um, cover, and that's been included in the paper as well, linked to that um, speech. Um, the timeframes um, have been modified, um, so the, now the final report is due to the Minister in June um, 2023 instead of April. Um, so that means the consultation will run from um, when the report is released in October um, till the end of February um, next year. And so that will provide the next opportunity for Council to engage with this um, process and um, formally submit on the draft report. And so I'll just leave it there. Yeah. 
Hey, thank you, Celia. Look, um, I, I think we'll just have a discussion and clarity and all that stuff in the one thing here because we've we've done a lot of talking around this, but um, go to you first, Jenny. Well, there was a really good workshop at the local government New Zealand conference on this. That's the notes I got from Jim that have been um, circulated. I think that it's really good. Those points that they made in there would be a very good place to start the evaluation of the next document that's coming out in October. Uh, because actually, interestingly enough, if you read those, most of those points were covered in things that we said. So it's interesting to see that there were common themes across all councils and there's common thinking in terms of a whole lot of areas uh, be between what we said, what other councils said and what the panel has come out with. I think um, it's very interesting. The other thing that I should say is that I signed off a, a joint statement with Naitahu uh, on the advice of staff um, that they've put up in their submission because the panel um, consulted EWI in a different stage process to they consulted councils was a bit later on. So I think I've only just signed that off in the last couple of days, uh, but it very much fits in with our two-year agreement and our um, our local bill that we've just done. So I think that that's fine. I do understand that Naitahu had some views around um, the long-term planning and the annual plan. I'm not sure that I can remember what was in there about that or whether there was anything about that. But next time around, um, I just wonder if staff could note that there has been some work around 2012 with the Local Government Commission, earlier work that seems to have been forgotten on what actually that what would be a viable alternatives to long term planning and annual plans, and there was quite a lot of money spent on that research. So um, if someone could just check with the panel to see if they've dug that out, because they really need to be taking a fresh approach to that, because councillors say that everywhere, but it's quite difficult to be over what an alternative structure would look like in a complex piece of legislation. So I just wanted to note those things, and I think yeah, Jenny, I I just cut you off, but you can answer this. Um, because I think that was also about the alignment of those things, because they're so far out of alignment, this, you know, the long term planning processes and the GPS and all those other things that we, we find we're always six months behind. And that's just a recurring theme. I don't think we need to do that. But that question from you, are you specifically wanting an answer to that question or is that just for information? OK. OK, um, Vicky, and then Phil. Oh, so Phil, and then Grant. Thank you, Peter, and, and look, thank you for this really good summary. Um, and and just, uh, I was going to ask about that point around alignment too, and like it has been made many times, as um, as Councillor Scott said. I'm just wondering, rather than sort of wait for for this all to be tied up in the future for local government at national level, if there's a way that we as a council might kind of like instigate um, the alignment of the processes with the other TAs, for example, even starting with Greater Christchurch, because I'm sure they would have submitted exactly the same way. And so I'm just, I'm just wondering, and I'm aware that that may require what require resourcing, but I'm just wondering if that might be a possibility. I understand from talking to various people that that is going to be part of what their expectations are next time they come out, and it will be around structure discussion. The panel is going to have an expectation like that. That's basically what I got from talking to the panel members. So I think that's good thinking. Just had a question from uh, Tumutayo Cranwell regarding that mention of Naitahu that you mentioned. Um, and he said, if there's a paper there, could you send it to him? So that so I'm part. I thought he would have already seen it. <laughs> but a further question, if I may. Sorry, I'll, I'll get that sent to you. Um, so thank you, Celia. There's one other point I just wanted to raise in terms of Savia thinking around it, and it's in in the first bullet point on paragraph nine on page twenty five. So it's really around the meaning of the term partnership. And, like, and I know there's been some discussion about that, and you've got the concept of um, communities and community partnerships too. But in many ways, you know, and we also, you know, and alongside that, we often uh, frequently refer to working collaboratively and cooperatively, all those things. I'm just wondering, like, the partnership, for example, what we have in Aitahu has a very special meaning. 
And I'm just wondering if perhaps we might find ways, and I don't want to be cement, semantic, but and um, how we could sort of clarify, um, I guess, the almost levels of partnership. Because I guess partnership, and where I'm coming from, is a partnership to me involves a, a kind of like a standing of equality on an equal ground. And what's clearly, for example, with some of the smaller community groups, there's a pretty big pad differential. So I'm just wondering if there might be ways that, you know, in terms of us develop, developing even future local government for us, if we could somehow take that into account. And I and I, and I don't expect you to answer that, no, uh, Celia. No. Um, that's um that's a reasonably that's a reasonably good question. There is some. Um, it's a bit of a loaded gun that one. I think you know, given what we're in at the moment. But that's a it's a fair question. It's fair. No, that's cool. Okay, Grant. Uh, I've got a comment really just on an observation on that speech um, that was given to LGA and the reference to the voting age being lowered to 16 and possibly looking at the terms of the elected membership extending beyond three years. So that'd be interesting to see if in their final report um, they actually come out with those sort of things. But yeah, interesting given we've just been talking with you throw poop about things. So. Yeah, just um, just a thought, and, and it may be that I'm not remembering enough of what I've read before to know if this is something on the cards or we've talked about it. But um, I'm just wondering, given that on the capability and capacity side of things, have we talked about um, having like systems in place to educate, to bring people in from schools, universities, and actually through the regional councils, through the TAs, a really clear sort of career path for local government. But given especially that we, we you know, we seem to be very good at then our people moving on up to central government. Now, is that something that's been mooted? You know, actually putting some money in to, ed you know, flagging that opportunity, really interesting, diverse, area of work, hugely important to society, environment, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of talk about not wanting us immigrants coming in. <laughs> so, you know, where, where's the where's the where's the um, investment for homegrown and, and really bringing people in from, you know, young and getting engaged and, 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 and so on? Has that been mentioned? Sorry if I've missed I think that's a really good question, but I think it actually kicks deeper than just trying to intervene here. I mean, we've talked ad infinitum about the lack of civics in our education system. We're put that's in there, so that's good. So that's good. Do you want to keep going, Vicky? Well, oh, really just to say, if it's not, if we've not flagged explicitly, it's not quite the same as citizenship. I think that's, you know, and civics. That's in, sorry, civics. That's really important. But this is more specifically around local government career, TAs, regionals, and a career path. Thank you. Try to add a is the local government um, offices organisation that's the equivalent of local government New Zealand and it certainly has a focus on workplace workforce development and workforce you know that whole focus on local government's career so they certainly as a as a pan New Zealand body um, for senior local government members that's where it comes through from that's where our probably our work is done through them. So the question then is should we be highlighting that as something that needs additional resource or is an opportunity to ensure that capability and capacity is achieved that the, the, the elected representatives can be advocating for through our solutions. Uh, as I understand, there was quite a lot of advocacy around a separate leadership training initiative that would be funded. And indeed, we used to have that in New Zealand, but it got defunded. And it's about community leadership and bringing people forward, just like Vicky described. And I do believe that the it would be a good thing to put in our one next time and see if it gets picked up in the report that's just coming out because it has already been raised, but I didn't see it in that summary, not that specifically. Now, the other thing I just want to comment about is the whole definition of partnerships. Um, I used to be called the head of governance, community and partnerships at CCC, and that was because the whole partnership has had, been subject to 20 years of development, and there's whole documents on how councils should do partnerships. And partnership has a specific definition in terms of the local government sector. So in a way, I sort of agree with what Phil's saying. 
and uh, particularly now we've got our much stronger partnership with um, Mana Whenua. And maybe it's time to think about how we put um, the treaty in that, in that where we're talking about our relationship with, um, and, and I know that's a contentious debate, but it's, we need to step that up because that's just not a partnership likes to find in my job as the head of partnerships. So, so it is something though that's had a lot of writing. There's been books and things written about it. So, I do think we have to be a bit clearer about that. So, I think that's a good point. Thank you. Um, I think we're just about done here. So, we'll see if we can get this uh, the note up. Unless there's anybody else got anything else. So the notes in front of you on 8.3, uh, the update on the future local government review, the next step. So can I have a mover for that, please? Thank you, Mr. Stephen. Thank you, Grant. All those in favour, please say aye. All those against, uh, that is carried. Thank you, Cecilia. Uh, so we go to 8.4, which is Andrew, I think you're here, aren't you? Sure. Um, which is district um, planning liaison update, and this is pretty, Interesting stuff in here. So, Andy, we'll leave. I'll leave it to you. And I see that Jeff Smith was down to, to do this, Andrew. Then I go to councillors. You're correct, Mr. Chair. Um, Jeff Smith was down to be presenting this paper. Unfortunately, Jeff's battling a COVID infection, which is which has been reasonably tough on him. Um, I think he's coming out the other end of it now but he's still coughing and it doesn't feel like the right environment to bring someone in with that sort of symptom. In, in terms of the paper counsellors, I, I wasn't going to drop, dive into the detail of this paper. Rather, I was going to give counsellors an overview of the um, program of work that we undertake here and the reasons why we do it. Feel free to ask any questions on the detail of the paper. As you know, as part of our regulatory system, we have a regional policy statement. Our regional policy statement must be given effect to by both our own regional plans and by our district council's um, district plans. To ensure that the regional policy statement is implemented, um, we have a team of people with an ECAN that work alongside the district councils to ensure that the district plans align nicely and sit together with our regional planning framework to create an integrated regulatory system. This supports our level of service to work collaboratively with the regions, districts and city councils to implement and give effect to the regional policy statement. We have a target in the LTP to provide planning support for Canterbury Territorial Authorities completing district plan reviews and plan changes on issues of regional significance. I would like to point out to councillors that this has been one of the busiest years in this work programme, at the same time as we are also working alongside to build a partnership and develop our own new um, regulatory framework for Canterbury. In saying that, um, one of the things that we've gained great benefit from is the very strong relationships at a staff level with all of the 10 district councils. And I think that at a staff level, we're supported quite well by you as a governance body who's also meeting with the district councils and supporting that work. Don't think I need to say any more in terms of an introduction to this paper, and I'm open for any questions on the detail of the work program that we've been following. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Look, um, and Jeff, I see you online, so I hope you, hopefully you, uh, you're hearing this and you don't have to uh, sit through it. Look, we've, we've got a heap of time here. Um, I'd allowed the fact that we might go for another like 45 minutes uh, to the end of this, and we've got just the Naitahu update at the end of this. So this is an opportunity. Uh, we'll just it'll be a free and frank discussion rather than you know you talking matters of clarification. If you're happy with that, Andrew, because I think there's some stuff here that uh, g g given some information that we had this morning around RMA reform, who wants to be the you know the guinea pig and all that stuff. And how would that fit with this stuff? Because to me, it's quite unclear. Um, and so I'll just, uh, no one's got anything, has is, is anyone got anything to 
uh, question Andrew about because my first question is quite a basic one and and I'm I'm prepared to be 100% wrong on this. You talked about our regional policy statement and forming district plans, and that's my understanding, along with NPSs and NESs. That's how we go through that process um, at the moment. And now we're talking about something called a regional spatial plan, which is going to have its own planning committee. Um, and in my mind, when I saw that, when I first thought that, I thought, oh, well, that's, that's fair enough because that will take the place of the RPS. Uh, and then we will have a hierarchy of planning that comes out of it, which would still give regional uh, TAs and regional councils the opportunity to be more bespoke within uh, the direction given by the spatial plan. How far wrong am I on that? I think in essence, you're 100% correct. I, I, I am going to take a step back here, though, uh, Mr Chair. The, there are a range of environmental issues that are present across Canterbury. Whether the national legislation is the Resource Management Act or whether it's a Strategic Planning Act and a Natural and Built Environment Act, that paper will not change the issues that we're facing in Waitaha. Ultimately, what we're doing is we're supporting district councils to deal with and create solutions to local, local problems in their communities. No matter what happens with our resource management legislation, maybe that changes and, and shapes and redirects, but those issues and problems that are being faced by those communities will still be there and will still need to be resolved. I endorse the work program that the district councils are taking on when they're working on resolving issues that are right in front of their communities. And I think that so supporting the resolution of those, whether it's under the Resource Management Act or the Natural and Built Environment Act, is what we should be doing to help improve the environment of Waitaha. I don't know if that actually answers your direct question, but it, it, because I've jumped too far forward, I think in my own thinking about where that might be, uh, and we're not there yet. Um, and as you say, quite rightly, the work still continues. So you know, we should, I, I, in my view, I should view it from that point of view. So Phil and then Liz, and then Grant. Thank you, Andrew. I just wondered how, in fact, um, part well, was it the next paper? As you're aware. Is around um, Nitaku Bill, um, our Act, as you know. But I just wondered, um, in this reference under Section 32 on our page 32 as well, to Māori participation, and and I just wondered, in fact, what while that's sort of a there's um, examples there of where um, some um, projects, you know, in planning, it is involved. I just wondered um, how, in fact. Um, our partnership with Naitahu might kind of like be at a, at a at least at the let's say obviously the same level of of the TAs. But it's just how we might be able to incorporate that um, in this sort of work. That's all. But, and and through you, Mr. Chair, um, Peter, you may be able to you may be able to assist me with my question too because I'm not quite sure about where we go with this. <laughs> I think the, the driving force behind this work program is implementing the regional policy statement. The, the, the regional policy statement was developed using the process in the Resource Management Act that requires specific engagement with tangata whenua. Each district council must also follow the process in the Resource Management Act, which also requires engagement with tangata whenua. In saying that, we've heard through our partnership Kōrero that there are elements of our existing regulatory framework that do not meet the expectations of mana whenua. And we need to address th those elements through the review of the Canterbury regulatory framework, through the work that we're doing with the partnership. At the same time, I hark back to the comments that I made to the chair around there are issues there right now. We know that there are those some of those issues um, directly impact on mana whenua values. Waiting until we've developed our new regulatory framework to implement it doesn't, to me, seem to support that delivery of mana whenua outcomes in Waitaha. So I actually. I, I, 
I don't see that there's a disconnect here, councillor. I, I see that this piece of work helps support that future work. But I'm also signalling that that future work does need to look at the outcomes that we're aiming for because we've had specific feedback that that's not meeting the needs of Mana Whenua. Thank you. And, and I guess um, you, you've kind of like filled in the, the, the part of the paragraph that I, I would like to see, which what I guess um, because it, it is that sort of overall connection with Naitahu that um, yeah, I, I guess you, you've highlighted it, and I think that would be just like a useful addition. That's right. Yeah, and my question is about the um, <clears throat> on page 31.21, uh, uh, Mackenzie District Council about the Indigenous Vegetation Plan Change 18. Um, and it talks there about um, uh, the decision to include a map identifying most of the Mackenzie Basin as significant indigenous vegetation and significant habitat of indigenous fauna. Um, and there's debate as to, um, well, there's a decision that it, it should not be included in the plan. Um, and that we're reserving our position on consequential changes to the provisions. Can you just explain the rationale around that? Um, it's sort of not, I'm not 100% clear on it as it is written there. So it'd be good to just hear a bit more on that. I'll have to come back to you on the reasoning, um, Councillor. I have, I have a, I can provide an update of the process that we're going through there, but I, I want to make that clear that that's, um, that's a, a live, court process at the moment and unfortunately this morning I didn't ask the question whether I could disclose that information but I asked some other questions about what I can disclose in terms of that court process. What, what, what I can say about the process that's been going through is that finding is a direct finding of the Environment Court so it has been tested through that process. What I can also say is that the court is now trying to set down um, time for expert conferencing and that's um, likely to be between Meridian, DOC, Forest and Bird and EDS, where our role in this process is a 274 party. So we're watching this process to ensure that we can provide accurate advice to other councils who are also trying to determine these same issues. Um, I believe that the court is aiming for that expert conferencing to be completed by December this year. And potentially mediation will follow that expert conferencing. Our role in that is to continue to support the court through our knowledge of both um, expert analysis around biodiversity elements and through our um, position as being the administrators of the regional policy statement. But we're not in there necessarily to drive a particular outcome. We're simply there as a 274 party with a watching brief. I'm not expecting a decision to come out from the Plan Change 18 process until well into 2023. And that would be in line with um, the court's expectation around conferencing and mediation occurring this year and, and, uh, and, and early next year. I apologise for not being able to answer the detail, Councillor. Just another um, piece to add to that, Andrew. So because the plan um, uh, is proposed, then uh, am I right in uh, suspecting that the rules in that plan um, apply, uh, but they're being challenged because um, EDS or someone else doesn't think they're wide enough? Is that right? Yeah, the challenge is around, as I understand it, what is improved pasture, and it's complicated in a Mackenzie Basin context because of the cryptic nature of the vegetation that exists there. I.e., I, it's a dryland ecosystem, and you might have some exotic grasses, but in amongst that exotic grass, you might have a range of mosses and liverworts that are um, critically endangered, but are not easy to see. So, is that, so, so just sorry, not hold this up too much, but is that an over? hang from Plan Change 13 and the fact that Plan Change 13 wasn't specific enough? Or was that, did, don't answer it, don't answer it. Mm. The 
plan change 13 was an earlier plan change. Plan change 13 was um, developed by McKinsey District Council to achieve their requirements around landscape protection. So that's that was when the finding came out that said the McKinsey Basin is an outstanding landscape. Plan change, plan change 13 did not deal with indigenous biodiversity, which is also a matter in section six. Plan change 18 deals with those elements, those section six elements, uh, section six of the resource management elements relating to um, the protection of significant indigenous flora and fauna. Thanks, Andrew. I, I've read just your, your comments earlier, just sort of picking up on um, that item 31 on page 32, that, that your involvement and your team's involvement with the district councils and, and your comment that the main risk of not being involved is missed opportunities uh, to ensure that an integrated regional planning framework is delivered. So, I mean, that's the thrust of, of collaborating and communicating. So that sounds really, really good. I, I did have a, a, a question, but it might be too much detail. Was on page 28, the um, item nine, um, Waimakariri District Council, that you were um, helping them in um, just identifying or managing the qualifying matters. And um, I mean, you could give us a link, but it'll be in the um, Urban, urban development NPS, I suppose, what they are. But I mean, could you just briefly tell us what they might cover? So, um, under the Enabling Housing Act, councils are required to make changes to their district plans in August 2022, I think by the 20th of August 2022 to ensure that the medium density residential standards are, are implemented within their district plans. As you will recall, councillors, the medium density residential standards, that, that's the three houses um, per property up to three storeys high. In simple terms, there's more requirements in the Enabling Housing Act than that. You do not need to, a district council does not need to um, develop that medium density residential standard in areas where a qualifying matter might exist. A qualifying matter in this context is say something like a natural hazard area, significant high hazard natural hazard area, an outstanding landscape, like we were speaking about in the McKenzie context, but for us that in, in, in a greater Christchurch context, that might be something more like the Waimakariri River itself or the Port Hills in terms of their landscape values. I think also, um, importantly, the airport noise contour, which we've spoken as a council in the past about and which does exist within our regional policy statement, is also a qualifying matter. I hope that answered your question, councillor. Thank you very much. Two questions, um, basically for clarity, really. I'll, I'll go back if I can and add on my question to Elizabeth's um, question, which was uh, plan change 18 and the court decisions are district plan um, decisions. Is there some wider implications for regional councils or for NPSs around the significant, raising your eyebrows here, <laughs> around the significant natural areas um, as well? So it does become a judicial Direction. Uh, in, um, I'm pretty sure it's Appendix Three of our regional policy statement. We can we have re, re criteria for how you identify whether an area is significant or not in terms of vegetation. That has a direct link back to Policy Nine Three One in the regional policy statement that says district councils must. Um, identify and protect areas of significant vegetation. That is the key reason why this is critically important to us, because we are going out and reviewing our, our, our regulatory framework. This case law, and we've had some as well, I think you'll recall some enforcement action on Kaitareti Spit that occurred um, 
Well, the, it, the, those pieces of, of, of court action help us understand what we need to change in our regulatory framework to achieve either the outcomes of the Resource Management Act or if we have a new act, a new Natural and Built Environment Act, as um, Mr Chairman was suggesting, how we might deliver on the requirements of that act. So, so this is really important um, future thinking work for us because it provides us a direction of where the courts are pointing us as to how we achieve our functions. My second question does go back to um, Mr Chair's first question there um, and, and around the reforms or RMA reforms. Can you just confirm that regional councils still will be developing the regional policy statement? Under the current sort of graphics that we are being shown, it's at the moment because the regional planning committee roles in the graphics in a workshop that we've had um, doesn't suggest that that regional spatial strategies um, is going to be taken over by them. <laughs> it, it, no, look, it's highly likely that councillors will have more information than I will as the planning manager. I, my, my, um, in, 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 I guess my job description is to implement the current law that we have today as it stands, and to do it in line with the direction that central government's given us, and the, and that's what we've together, I think, um, worked up as part of the long term plan, and and you have adopted as your long term plan. There is, as I understand it, no real way of us understanding exactly what might be in the Strategic Planning Act or the Natural and Built Environment Act until those acts are produced. But we still have requirements under the existing Resource Management Act to deliver, um, particularly a freshwater regulatory instrument by December 2024. Um, now, I'm just raising this uh, because it's been raised with me by um, Mackenzie a lot, and I don't seem to have any answers for them. Um, so they've got a big problem with gravel extraction, haven't they? Or they have. That's what they tell me every time they see me. Now, I'm just wondering, is in here is there any room for them to raise that or is it too late in the process or doesn't it fit here <laughs> because of our other processes yeah that's what i thought but i just thought i'd give it a blow, try chair jenny I, I might need to take that offline because i i haven't i haven't heard that issue from mckenzie i was down there just last week meeting with aaron hackett their planning manager and we followed up with a with a team's call this week, and on neither of those two engagements did that issue of gravel extraction come up. Okay, we've got uh, Megan, and then Vicky, and then Elizabeth. I feel like Andrew knows what I'm going to ask. Um, um, obviously, um, Cell and District Council, the private plan change requests, and obviously there'll be, from time to time, there's others that come up throughout the district. I guess... Um, I still have a question in my mind about our rationale of providing submissions opposing private plan changes uh, for additional housing development, um, simply because they're outside projected infrastructure boundary. Um, obviously, responsibilities around the NPS in terms of um, risk health source, that sort of thing, understand those concerns and those matters. But just can you step us through the rationale for continuing to oppose housing development uh, in Greater Christchurch? I think I'd like to say two things there, Councillor. I, I think first up, um, you're entirely correct that we have a infrastructure boundary in the regional policy statement. And as the first of those private plan changes came through, we used the projected infrastructure boundary as part of our evidence to oppose those developments, indicating that they sat outside of the regional policy statement framework 
and therefore that the regional policy statement that that said that sort of development should be avoided and that based on the case law that came from the King Salmon case that avoid means avoid and, and therefore that means please don't do it. We've had a number of those. Um, we, we haven't won that. We haven't won that line. Um, you know, we, we, we've still seen those private plan changes go ahead and and, and on none of those private plan changes has the regional council appealed those plan changes. We've we've put it out about that um, as at you as a council, and and you've come down with let's let, let's not take that any further. We've also been working alongside Christchurch City, in an, in essence, simply to um, reduce costs on the ratepayer. If we're presenting a very similar case, that means that. Um, what, what, why should we double up on costs? It's, it's, it, it, it doesn't make any sense. But both us and Christchurch City have recognised that pushing that line of RPS alignment is, is not useful. So you will note that future submissions that have been made around that have focused simply on the merits of those. So if there is going to be an impact in terms of um, transport, then we've raised that as one of the issues that might be um, coming from further development here. We've raised issues like public transport, that if you're going to put a development here, then the road widths need to be wide enough for our for our buses to get down. But we've changed our approach from being simply slavishly saying that you're outside the infrastructure boundary, so therefore it's bad. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. Um, I guess the follow-up for that is, um, Pleased to hear that there's been a little bit of a change in tact, but um, given we've got the spatial plan work coming up and ongoing, it'll be quite some time before that's landed. Um, while that still would be to land, at what point would we start to consider um, what that draft spatial plan or what some of the policies are starting to firm up like when we're considering some of these matters? This Facial plan will be a document that will be prepared, I think, under the Local Government Act. As such, once that document is prepared, it can be taken into account in resource management decision making. Look, um, I've got I've got a point I'd like to make with Megan's question is that our, 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 our RPS or the RPS that we have in place is supposed to keep us this side of the Wild West show in terms of what's going on. And you know, this um, hodgepodge development by individuals that getting away from the infrastructure, getting away from our ability to service those things, um, it needs to be, you know, in my opinion, needs to be called. If we've got an RPS, then RPS should be taken account of. And I, I don't know how happy or unhappy I am about your comments about where we're at with that, but I mean, that's my really firm view on that because we're the ones for the region, for the region, that point to the way things should be done in some sort of order. Anyway. That's my week. Thank you. Liz. I just wanted to very briefly um, echo Chair Huey's point about gravel extraction with MDC. Um, so it is something that gets brought up with me every time I bump into um, Councillor Barwood or Mayor Smith. Um, and it was brought up a couple of years ago at our Gov to Gov with Mackenzie District Council um, as a major issue. So yeah, just to quickly um, echo that. And I have related to staff, but perhaps not through the right um, lines or something. Yeah, um, so I'll just firstly pick up on that, um, pushing back on the private plan changes. So essentially, what I think you're saying is actually lines in a way with what Peter has said. It's just that what you're doing is going deeper, not just saying no because it's outside the boundary. Presumably, the reason it's outside of the boundary is because of the specific issues that you're flagging, but you're now being actually specific about it so it can be taken away and used <laughs> in a sensible way to try and address it, given that the reality is it's like it's may get passed. Um, in terms of my question, um, on point nine on page 28 with the Waimakadiri District Council and the variations we're giving feedback on, part two talks about financial contributions to mitigate or manage potential adverse effects of natural hazards that are generated by urban development. And I'm wondering what financial contributions from whom and to whom, but also now thinking, well, wh what natural hazards are we talking? Are we talking about flooding here? Exacerbating flooding is that the issue? Oh, thank you. 
what, what you've said is entirely correct. Um, uh, I'll just reiterate it in terms of an answer to your question. So financial contributions, as I understand it, they are required under section and uh, can be required under section 108 of the Resource Management Act. The council requires a developer or a, a person seeking a resource consent to pay financial contributions to offset or mitigate the effects of their development on, on an environmental element. In this case, why Makariri District is concerned principally with flooding, as, as you've spoken about, or, or natural hazards, and, and, and flooding is a big one in the Wai Makariri District. And the idea behind collecting financial contributions there is so that instead of the ratepayer needing to fund those mitigating works, the, the, if they're exacerbated by a new development, the new development needs to pay by way of a financial contribution. So, yeah, so on that though, Presumably, the scale of impact or additional hazard that's generated, that's gone through a process. So we're talking about a minimal amount or a manageable amount that through a financial contribution can be managed with that. Yeah, does that make sense? There's a question in there. <laughs> the, the question makes entire sense. Um, and it's almost like councillor you read our comments back to why Makariri district because um our, our direct comments back to the council was it's very hard to determine what contribution a new development might have to a natural hazard effect and uh, in essence i think um i think we're very much on the same page here in terms of the challenge that we have um in terms of the identification of who should pay what share i think the one thing I, I should be saying is from a professional point of view, I actually commend Waimakariri District for grabbing the bull by the horns and trying to grapple with the fairness and equity issue of new development versus existing ratepayer funding for these issues. Um, don't the TLA set uh, an um, amount yeah. through their policy that, that under Section 108? Is to, but they don't have an amount for that particular issue. Is that what the issue is? Yeah, thank you. That's actually a really good question. There's two different ways that a, a district council can gain um, fi financial assistance from a developer. One is a development contribution established under the Local Government Act. That needs to be listed as part of your development contributions policy, and that's where you have a specific fee on a, a lot by a lot basis. A financial contribution cannot be taken for the same purpose as a development contribution, but is available under the RMA, and that is considered on a consent by consent basis, rather than a development contribution that is a, a more like a fixed fee set as part of um, the district council's long term plan process. Well, we've just about done this. So, Phil, one last question, and think about um, if you've got another question after Phil, we'll take one more after Phil. If the Andrew, this goes back to the question that Megan asked in relation to cell and district council and the private plan changes. So, like, and you said, look, we, as a way of dealing with this now, we focus on the issues and gave public transport as an example. Like, there was a range of views uh, reported around the value of productive soils or the, the, the qualification of that. So, do we? All, do, I just wonder what what line we took in on that. been indicating that if it's a class one or two or three soil, we should avoid development there. We would be greatly assisted as a council if a national policy statement on highly productive land was released. We understand at a staff level that that's imminent, but as yet it has not received royal assent or gazettal. Um, Andrew, thank you for that. You're pretty... Um, um, you're pretty thorough in your answers, which I think we should appreciate. Um, I'm, I'm sure that Jeff will be disappointed he wasn't here to go through this process with us, but I think you filled in reasonably well for him, Andrew. Um, 8.4 is on the screen in front of us, and it notes the wide range of ongoing planning processes that staff have involved in, including district plan reviews, private plan changes, requests, district development strategies, bylaws, and regionally significant notified resource consent applications, and two, notes the ongoing um, benefits of this work program 
providing support to the territorial authorities and ensuring that there is a consistent implementation of the regional planning framework across Canterbury. Can I have a mover for that, please? Thank you, Councillor Mackay, seconded by Councillor Farm. All those in favour, please say aye. All those against, that's carried. Thank you very much for that. And could I invite uh, David Perinara O'Connell uh, to the table? And David will take us to the like, last item, which is a bit um, redundant, uh, which is 8.5 in the Naitapu Bill update. Uh, and since we've got Royal Assent, I think this um, this, <laughs> this can, can stay where it is actually, David. But um, there, there are some bits, I think, that we are going to add on to this briefing uh, or to this, this paper. So, David. Kia ora koutou katoa, uh, ngā kai kaunihira o te rā, uh, ngā mihi uh, kia koutou. Um, thank you, Chair, and yes, as, um, as you've noted, uh, the bill was um, received its third reading uh, in Parliament last Wednesday, um, and, uh, and obviously passed that and then received royal assent um, from the Governor-General on Monday um, of this week. Um, and then, uh, since then, um, probably the key things to, to note uh, in, in this verbal update is uh, that uh, on Monday evening, um, Te Runanga Ongaita, who then commenced the process um, uh, calling for applications, um, and that notice was uh, distributed to all Ngaitahu members over the age of 18 years um, living in New Zealand. Um, and that information that was distributed included uh, the Environment Canterbury um, Candidate Handbook, um, which uh, has been supplied to um, all uh, prospective candidates um, uh, by the governance team. Uh, the applications uh, for the Ngaitahu um, uh, Council roles closes on the 31st of August um, and thus gives Papatapurunanga the Papatapurunanga Appointments Panel all of September um, to run their process with regard to um, making uh, the appointments. Uh, the notification of the Ngaitahu councillors will occur the day after the official result of the 2022 election uh, is declared um, via notification from the Te Runanga Ngaitahu Chief Executive uh, as is set out in the Act. Um, and Julian and I are working closely with both the governance team and staff at Te Runanga Ngaitahu to ensure that the transition of the Ngaitahu councillors um, uh, joining the elected councillors happens seamlessly. Um, so uh, that's the further update, and I've provided those um, those bulleted notes to this the uh, committee secretary um, to record for the minutes. So that's good. I think the, the Royal Assent bit should be in the minutes, and I think the discussion that we're having is quite important to follow up on this. I'm not too sure how the recommendations sit as they read, so maybe someone that's a bit more uh, literate than I can look at those and see if they um, are fit for purpose. Um, are there any questions of David? Phil? Thank you, David, and thank you so much for your support around this now, the Act now. Um, and my question really was um, having heard the debate that it seemed to me there was some misleading information because they're misunderstanding but I failed to see how it was misunderstood. It was particularly around for example the comments that um, the, the the new um, councillors from Naitahu would be in effect appointed by Trond and, and, and to the point that this would create a conflict of interest so I, I just wondered, is there a way that we as a council now can kind of like, um, clearly they are applications that we said we're calling for them. Is there, is there a way perhaps that we can highlight that in fact, you know, this is an, an, a Naitahu process and, and um, it's certainly not by appointment by a corporate. Thank you, uh, Councillor Clearwater. Um, I think we'll we'll continue to work um, as we are. We're continuing to get media queries um, and and uh, working to um, clarify some of those misunderstandings. Um, our main point um, through a lot of the progress of the bill around questions of conflict of interest has been that they'll be managed in the same way in which all conflicts of interest are managed by um, our council processes and standing orders. So. 
um, that's what we'll continue to work through. Uh, just to follow up on that, I've had some um, discussions with comms about that, and I know they've been talking to David every time I have a discussion with them. They talk to David uh, or the other way around. Um, but we have talked about developing a more explicit part on our website where we can explain those things, and we have indeed got a list of some of the commonly asked questions up there. And what we've done with the letters is we're referring everybody who writes in to that column, so we're giving them that link and it's much more explicit than it was. I did talk to um, staff recently uh, around um, maybe we, we should do some sort of um, feature comment around it that, ex that explains those main things, and I think we're still sort of considering that, although I haven't had an explicit discussion with Taflin about that recently, but I do feel like we probably need to put something out, um, you know, maybe next month, um, and get it that in the career in the press because um, that is a common question that's being asked everywhere and there is quite a lot of correspondence coming in about this uh, and it's continuous I don't think it's going to go away for a while and I know candidates are being asked this as well so um, you know and we did send out to you though I think if you tell me if you're wrong did you get an email with a whole lot of stuff in it because I asked for that to happen yeah and that was helpful but that question that Phil just said then is the most common question that people are asking because the thing is, and yesterday when I was talking to the Rural Support Trust in North Canterbury, there is not any any way really for ordinary people to find out about Papatapu Runanga other than they think about Naikato and all they hear about, you know, Tront, really a big corporation. So it, so it is difficult that for them to understand, but once you explain all that, they have a totally different way of looking at it. So I don't know. It's going to be an ongoing issue, I think. But I, but we are trying to do those things internally. So so it's good that you raised that again, Phil. I'm sure everyone's uh, getting similar stuff from people. Uh, Can I just say that we need to make this a really exciting thing in the minutes, not just have it like this. So so I think we should need to record this appropriate that this is a real, a very big historic occasion and a step up in. Um, Ewe Council relationships, and we are celebrating the fact that it's now being royally promulgated and that it's in operation. The minutes need to record that. I mean, if somebody looks back in history and sees that we noted and up this, Peter's quite right. So if we can get something like that in there, I think. Good. As, as I was going to say, I think we're all uh, getting uh, some sort of targeting from people that feel Petition franchised by the democratic process, as they put it, but are unable to express themselves beyond that. Um, <clears throat> and to me, I've engaged with as, as many as I can, but you get yourself to a wall that you can't get through with them. Um, and I don't think, um, from my personal experience anyway, is that email email trail isn't the way to go with this or you know social media. You need to reach, uh, meet people. Face to face. Do you want to add to that? I just have to say, yeah, I sort of agree with you. But where we've we've been writing back lovely letters, I must say that staff have been doing a fantastic job, um, and and people really are really appreciating that. They're coming back and saying, oh, I didn't expect to hear this back. So it's actually it's actually quite good, even though it's just one on one. But it but it is good that staff are helping do that. So, Mr. Chairman, this is a. I guess a, a statement on behalf of a, a constituent of mine, and I, I will ask that it be recorded. Um, the conversations that have been had with me over the last week are not about uh, Naitahu representation at the table, and I've stood up and said I've supported the process that we have, and that the Naitahu representatives bring a level of governance that far exceeds many of us at the table at times, and that I, I support and the value that it brings. <clears throat> And I haven't had too many people disagree with the fact that my Tahu folks sit at the table. Um, but the challenge that I constantly get is uh, the democracy question and the fact that they are appointed and not voted. 
uh, one of my constituents, Graham, if I could have him noted, um, was on the phone last night saying, I will start a rates revolt because I have no issue with my tahu at the table, but the loss of democracy is the challenge. And that's the challenge that's been put to me on a, on a constant basis. So I am reflecting the conversations that are coming to me. And so I said, you know, tried to have the debate, get the conversation to the point, and uh, pointed to me, I am his representative, and he absolutely requested that I bring the matter to the table. And I think this table is probably a better one than a full council meeting. And so the opportunity today, just to make that statement on his behalf and that of others, that they really struggle with the appointment as opposed to the democracy of the uh, of the appointment. So on behalf of Graham, I simply make that statement on his and others' behalf. Thank you, that John. I mean, I think you fully understand the advocacy role you have for your rate post, but we also have a regional role here in terms of the governance of this region. And we have for since 2016 supported this. So I'm not, I'm not going to go over that again. Jan. Uh, using uh, the, the speaker's uh, favourite word, I'm very challenged by the conversation that I'm hearing um, just now. Um, one thing I think uh, maybe uh, the council, ECAN, needs to go to the Ministry of Education to to help uh, with educating our people out in the wider community to um, actually educate themselves about Ngaitahu and who Ngaitahu is. And don't just be taken by the media that Ngaitahu means Tirunang or Ngaitahu. Um, yeah, so very, very challenged as... Uh, as someone says around the table, and also challenged about democracy. So if um, by tomorrow at 12 noon, there's only two candidates for a certain region, therefore there's no voting, right? So those two people get through automatically. How is that democracy? So, I mean, uh, I'm challenged. The NITO process is going to be a four-pronged process. It will probably be over, last time there was over 12 applicants that more probably anyone else runs against, and it's uh, yeah. So and it's that's, that's all my comments. Just uh, very challenged. I wish I was in the chambers today. Kia ora. Yeah, great reaction from you. Thanks for that, uh, Chair Huey. Chair Huey or Phil, one of you. I just want to to talk about what Tumutayo Kremel has said. I I, I just think. Um, there's a saying, I think it was one of Shakespeare's, that the devil can quote scripture for his own purpose. And when I am not referring to any comments that have been made at this table, I'm referring to comments that were made in Parliament. And so your definition of democracy, you know, it's a, an example was, yep, it's apparently OK to, for a political party of, of plenty of financial background backing to not stand a candidate in a particular seat for political purposes. So that's democracy. Yeah, right. So, um, and and also, I think the point was really, really made that for a, for a large group of people in our society who, in effect, have been disenfranchised and not involved in our political systems for for, for a long, long time, this was a way of turning that around. It it was also a way of actually um, democracy being able to mature, so that so that. People are Maori people, particularly, are able to be involved in our society and at this table. So I, I just think it is. I'm fo following back to Chair Jenny's suggestion, and in fact, we we note this with much um, firmer firmer acclaim than just simply noting it. I think there should be a way of doing that. I I um, certainly recall very clearly that when we made this decision, it was um, it was important for this council that it was unanimous. And it didn't mean that everybody agreed entirely with everything, but it meant that overall, this Vitnell Act is certainly heading our region, Canterbury, in the right direction. I, I don't think that anyone, I mean, I think we're pretty joined up here in terms of where we're at, and we're just commenting on what we're having to deal with outside. Um, and, and, and in no way, uh, no way second guessing what's already happened. I think everyone's pretty happy about that. Uh, Jenny. Um, yeah, thanks, Yayan. Um, I heard what you had to say. I do have to say, though, that um, until 2007, 
there was a really good process of uh, treaty education in our community. It had been going for about 10 years and all members of the public could access and it went around all rural places and actually felt, I went to it for a week in um, Kaikoura in 2004 um, when I was working with the Hapuku School. And I, I was just, I think that there is a place to advocate um, to the government that, you know, constitutionally we need to be um, enabling people to, um, to, to think more deeply about our treaty relationship and to think more deeply about our history. And, and to hear it from um, iwi representatives themselves, I think that's very empowering. So anyway, um, I think I'd like to, I'm going to suggest that the words that used, I'd like to have, I think we should put a comment in, like I said before, but we should change this to, and people can challenge me if they like, um, that the Regional and Strategic Leadership uh, Committee celebrates the Canterbury Regional Council Naitahu Representation Bill gaining royal assent on the, whatever date it was, 8th of August. I don't think there's going to be too many people disagree with you. We've, <clears throat> are we happy to go to that now? We'll put, no, no, not, 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 sorry, Jan, just a minute. What were you saying? You don't want to go, because we can go to the recommendations because I, this won't be recommendation one. Right, it'll be recommendation two. Recommendation one, we've made a slight adjustment to it. We were going to we were going to scrap we were going to scrap recommendation two, and what you were saying, Jenny, could be recommendation two. Yeah. We're down a staff member, so we just have to be very patient, Christine. Can we just get? Peter, just while that's going on, um, I'm wondering, um, Kathleen, if in the website if we were going to have some information, that the explanation I get from the notes that Jenny saw around, which kind of helps explain to people the democracy versus the world, you know, that those key issues. Um, so that the link, we, we can just see people are linked rather than, you know, um, if, if they want to enter into email sort of situations. And doing it in a way that looks like a, an official package, you know, like a memo that advise you not to. Thanks. So when these come up, the first one, which is pretty much the paper, We'll get a mover and second for that, and then we'll move. No, get a mover and second for the first one. And then the second one that Jenny's just proposed, which is being written out now, well, we've already got a mover and a seconder for the second one. But for the first one, it, <clears throat> what we've got there now is notes the verbal update on the Canterbury Regional Council NITO representation bill. That's what Dave has just given us. So we've got a mover for that. Someone would like to move that. Jenny, seconder. Grant. We'll take that. All those, all those in favour, please say aye. All those against, that's 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 carried. Now the second bit um, is there in front of you, and that's moved by Councillor, by by Chair Huey, and the second by Councillor Fairwater. I'm not sure where her numbers are going at the moment. We'll just wait till she's finished. Oh, I see you put two up. Yeah. No, you're sort of doubling down a bit, really. Yeah, can we take three out and we can put it back in? Just let's let's just go to two and then see if we need three. So, okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm happy. With it. So 
So we'll go to you, Jenny, and, and ask the mover. I'll move that. And I'd like to speak to, um, I think it's really important to say we're celebrating that because it's a historic occasion. And like I said before, it's a step up in council iwi relationships. And we signed up the government, who rep the Crown, who represents us all in 1997-98, signed up to doing our work in relationships with the tribe Naitahu differently. And we have we've sort of done it, but pretty hopelessly since then. So I think as a council, this is a fantastic outcome. We really have stepped up and it's it's not the final part, um, treaty partnership model that we might all want and we might get to eventually, but it's worth celebrating. So I'd like to say that we're celebrating this. So I recommend you all vote for it. I'm clearly strongly, strongly supportive. Um, David might be able to correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that we're the first regional council to be able to have um, Maori representation as part of our decision making. And and that regional council? Oh, someone made it by a Anyway, yeah, well, I guess Mana Whenua. Thank you for correcting me on that, David. Yes. So that, that you know, that. And also, particularly because staff and others here at this table have worked at this for so long, I just think it's a great a great cause to say yes, um, we're going to let's let's celebrate. Look, I can't understand why anyone wouldn't support this because it's happened. We wanted it to happen. Um, the celebrate is a more of a motive word. Uh, congratulate. I don't know what it should be, but to me, to me, that's that just records something that has happened. So I, I don't know if anyone wants to speak. Do you want to speak for it? I want to speak for it, yeah. Go. Just quickly, it is a celebration, absolutely supportive of this. It was celebrated by us, those people who attended uh, Parliament standing in the gallery. A very powerful um, level of support from councillors who attended, Naitahu people and others, and the the power and reasoning in the debating chamber from those four and, and in support of the bill uh, has, has seared into my mind in terms of some of the things that had been said. And it was historic, and that's why we need to celebrate it. I, 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 I would. Yes, John. I guess I struggled to celebrate it. I quite like the idea of being re-elected and coming back. And I have not had one person in my constituency tell me what we've done is a great thing. I have supported the appointment of the Naitahu representatives <clears throat> to this table uh, in the last triennium and lost a lot of political capital in doing so. And I have supported it again in this triennium and in every conversation I have, I note that I do support the appointment of those members and what they bring to the table. But I am not sure that I want to stand up and sing from the whatever and celebrate the appointment because I do really want to come back and be re-elected. So I have supported it all the way through. So I am sitting here trying to decide whether I vote for it or whether I abstain. <clears throat> and it is a real challenge for me. Okay. That's a fair comment. Um, um, shall I allow you to speak? So yeah, I just want to ask permission to ask John a question. Uh, John, what word would make you feel, what word would be good for you? <laughs> can say acknowledge. Yeah. Uh, acknowledge, yes, I would be happy there. I, I just, I struggle with the celebration given everything that's that's coming at me. So acknowledge, um, yeah, something a little less. And I understand why a whole bunch of people want to celebrate it. And I understand uh, from, a, from a Naitahu position and, and a bunch of folk why that celebration is there. But I'm, I'm just, just noting my my thoughts. I'll let others figure it out. So I've got to clear and then we'll go to Elizabeth and then Megan and then I think we'll just get to this actually. Um, look, you know, I'm happy that we've got the seal of approval and we're now going to have um, fully voting 
members of NITAHU sitting on our council meeting. But I, for me, it goes back to 2010 and what the commissioners did and made appointments and put a NITAHU person on the table then, and they had the full voting rights. And I know, OK, some people will turn around and say, well, democracy was taken away. 2016, which was um, when four of us were, that are sitting around this table um, came back in and sat um, on the transitional council when we had two elected or two appointed uh, Naitaho representatives with fully voted rights. I'd actually like to acknowledge the work that's gone on and in the build up to where we've actually got to as well. I, I, I don't want to dismiss that or just dis, dis, diminish um, that. Um, part of history either, because I think that's been really, really important to get us to where we are today. And I mean, I guess I'm, I'm reasonably proud of where we are as a, as a council. And I probably haven't had too many people. I've had some very close friends ask me about my position, and I've been able to justify that and sleep with that. Um, so I, I don't have any real difficulty. But Acknowledge probably sits a little bit more comfortably with me than celebrates. Thank you, uh, Elizabeth, and thank you, Bill. And I think we'll go to the motion. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I think I think we need to acknowledge that there are varying levels of comfort around the council table. Um, I think everyone thinks it's the right thing to do. That's why we voted in favour of it. And at this point, and, and it's not it's not perfect, but it gets us along the path to achieving that equity um, that we all want. Um, I think my main regret is that we didn't go out for consultation to our voters on this. That's the only that's the one and only thing that I that didn't sit comfortably with me. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to note that like, I'm quite comfortable with celebrating the passage of the bill. Um, it was great to be there. Um, and I think um, while, you know, as, as others have said, there's been different um, acknowledgements of, of comfort and, and also feedback from people, I guess I'd encourage people to have some courage in celebrating what that we've done and, and what we've gone before us. Because for me, sitting in the gallery and hearing some of the speeches, um, while I understand a number of the different arguments, my biggest take home was um, that there were people that perhaps had different views um, across all sides of the house, um, but had difficulty and lacked the courage um, to take a step that was going to be controversial, and we all knew that. Um, so I would just ask people to reflect in the next few minutes um, whether or not, if you do believe that this was a good step to take, um, that celebrate is the correct or, or the right um, thing to do. Um, thanks. We'll go to Phil as the second of the motion, then we'll go back to you, Jenny, and, and then we'll put the motion. Look, I'm really impressed with what, not only just what, what Megan has just said, but in fact, you know, that a was a good representation of our councillors, you know, celebrating in Wellington. And some of us would have just about jumped, including <laughs> Megan, would have just about jumped from the gallery down to to um, give old Billy Jackson a hug, maybe even Jerry too. Um, um, good. Um, so you know, I I'm to, I'm torn on this. I want uh, I, I want some consensus, I guess, around this. If if people, if people don't feel like putting it or doing celebrating, I guess I'll live with that. It might be too late in the debate to actually add this in, but I want to me one of the things I feel about this. I'm actually really grateful that this happened, but I'm particularly grateful for some incredibly hardworking staff, and to me that that's what helped win it. So I don't know if at this later stage, if Jenny might agree to adding in something like that, we thank the chief executive and environment country staff for their excellent work and supporting the bill and. You know that that be the tenor, but if if um, councillors haven't got time to actually consider that part of it, I accept um, basically finding a consensus. Okay, Jenny. So we're going to you as the mover of this, and so the structure of this is yours.
Good, that would be good. Thank you, Nicole. Um, I want to um, consider everybody, and, and I feel that democracy is a great big thing, and it's about a whole lot of different things. So it's even about what we've done. And it needs to be think of really broadly. And we're moving in democracy towards that. It's only been a short time in human history where we've seen it as it is. It's a very old concept that goes right back to the Romans. And they saw it different to us. And it's been seen different. It's different in Switzerland. It's different in, in, in Italy. It's different in France. It's different all around the world. And I think we're in such dire times. We need to acknowledge the past injustices and, and also we need to empower everyone in our community. And this is a way of empowering specifically mana whenua. But I also think we need to empower each other. We need to consider what's happening to each other in our electorates and that we are very brave people to put our hands up for election. Not many people want to do that. And it is a hard role to be out there, but it's really good if we can be unanimous and agree to something together. So I I think it would be in very, in, you think? I was going to say I'll move it to um, acknowledge, but anyway, if you want to leave it as it is, all right then. So the second thing I was going to say, and I hope that's okay with you, John, um, because I'd like to record in the minutes, get some words in the in in the minutes uh, with with um, Peter and me having some work with um, Christina to reflect what Claire said and some words around the staff in that because they have a bit of a blurb in the minutes, so that will record each of those things that was said, and that's quite okay to do that. So let's put this to the vote then, if, if everyone's okay, and I would like it unanimously supported. Thank you. Look, can I just thank everyone for the discussion on this, because I think it's been a bit cathartic for some people, but they've said the things they need to say here, uh, and we fully understand that. And thank you for your contribution, Megan, because I think uh, that's a big call from you to say what you said. So that, <clears throat> so the, the part two of the um, uh, the recommendation is there to celebrate the Canterbury Regional Council Naitahu Representation Bill, gaining royal assent on 8th of August 2022, moved by Chair Huey, seconded by Councillor Clearwater. All those in favour, please say aye. <coughs> All those against. Thank you, uh, Tumutai Cranwell, uh, for your support. Uh, all those against, there is nobody, so that is carried. So thank you very much for that. So that's our business for today. That's our business for today. Our next meeting, and we're having one more meeting, so we get another opportunity with this group. 21st September, which is, I think, it's the Wednesday before we break for good, uh, which is, um, uh, yeah, which will be opportunity. So thank you for your attendance. And I will just, uh, Lana's had to leave, so I'll just karakia us out of here. So karakia, fucking pie, karakia, fakakaria, te kōrero, Ki te tahu, o tu tahu whare, ki a tina, te kina ano, a tona wa, a tona wahi, haumie, huie, tai kia. And that karakia is about holding the discussion up on the ridge pole until we meet again, so quite appropriate. Thank you.